here. Vice Chair Milliken? I am here. Treasurer Davis? Here. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty here. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher here. Trustee Landau? Landau here. Trustee McKnight Morton? Thank you. Uh, first, tab A, the approval of the minutes. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the September 22nd meeting as submitted. Do I hear a motion? So moved. A second? Support. Any discussion on the minutes? Uh, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, first, we have citizen participation and verbal communications. Uh, Ms. Julie Kissel, are you ready? I am. Well, Go good ahead. After good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's October 2020. Um, you know, it seems that in every meeting or class, someone always asks how everyone is doing. And there's often this pause after the question. And finally, someone will say, fine, I'm fine. And in many ways, we are fine and we are surviving. But after a series of meetings recently, I can say that we're not always thriving. For months, nonstop, we have been working to make the best of this very difficult reality we are facing. We have much to be proud of, but the stress and anxiety is just barely hidden from many of us. Thankfully, a bright spot this month was the successful membership vote for the WCCEA contract extensions you will vote on later today. With nearly 70% of the membership voting, the final tally for both contracts was, nearly, was a nearly unanimous yes. The offer to extend the contracts came at the right time for the WCCEA and for the college and relieves us of a great burden of full negotiation in 2021. Thank you again to President Belanca and her team for such collaboration. As I reported last month, the WCCEA continues to meet and talk regularly with the administration, and there is still one act of grievance, but talks are ongoing. It is the WCCEA's hope that we will reach a just and equitable agreement. Justice and equity are very much part of the regular conversations among the WCCEA membership, and I continue to share these ideas with President Belanca in our frequent talks and at our dinner, our last dinner meeting a few weeks ago. So while contractual issues remain, I trust that through ongoing, honest conversations among and between the stakeholders, we can find a path forward. The issues are not insurmountable, but we will all need to bring our problem-solving mentality to the table. In today's meeting also, you will have a chance to approve a faculty sabbatical for the winter 2021. This sabbatical is for me. In my 16 years with the college, I have not yet taken a sabbatical. But with the openings this year due to COVID, I decided that a semester of research to work on the projects that I just don't have time for while I'm teaching would do me good. I will remain, of course, active in my WCCEA duties during this time, but I'm looking forward to digging into the data and working to benefit the WCC community. Lastly, election day is nearly upon us. For many of us, we have voted and are anxiously awaiting the results. This, of course, is adding to the stress in the classroom, in advising sessions and meetings. We all share in the strangeness of not having clear life work boundaries. A bright spot, though, is that my colleague and friend, Ernesto Carrijero, is running for one of the open seats for the Ann Arbor School Board. He stands to bring such value and experience to that board, so we wish him the best of luck next week. As leaders, it is our job to cultivate hope, even when things are difficult. President Obama once said that if you're walking down the right path and you're willing to keep walking, eventually you'll make progress. None of us are sure what the path before us looks like, but indeed we will keep walking, we will keep working, all while holding up one another along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kissel. Um, Vanessa, were there any public comments received? No. No? Um, any written communications? There was one that I sent earlier today. Yep, I saw that, thank you. Okay, first we will have our special reports. Uh, Dr. Hearns, are you ready? I am, I am. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. It brings me great pleasure, um, trustees, to uh, bring back um, one of our students um, who we've talked about before at a board meeting. 
um, in June, you watched a video about two WCC students who were recently selected for the prestigious NASA Community College Aerospace Scholar Program. Emily Segi and Maximilian Eager um, were those two students. Max and Emily were two of 273 students um, selected from community colleges across the country. NASA has designed the program to offer community college students an authentic NASA experience that allows them to get a <clears throat> look at the organization's unique mission, diverse workforce, and world-class facilities, as well as learn how to develop as future STEM professionals. While at WCC, Emily completed the pre-engineering science transfer associate's degree program with a 4.0 GPA. She is the past president of the WCC Outspace Club and was involved on campus in multiple other student organizations and activities, including serving as a chemistry peer tutor and working in the WCC Writing Center. She has started this semester at the University of Michigan to study aerospace engineering. Emily is here today to share her experience with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Hearns, for the very nice introduction. I am so, so, so excited to be able to present about my experience in NCOS because it was so transformative. And um, yeah, if, if we can kick it off. There we go. So I would like to begin with a question that I found myself asking a lot during this experience. And that was, how on earth did I end up at NASA? <laughs> so I've had a long running fascination with space. This didn't just come out of left field. When I was a young teenager, I used to sneak up on the roof of my childhood home all the time just to get a better view of the night sky. Every time I looked up, I felt this visceral pull to learn more. And I soon realized that I really wanted to work on space vehicles. This pull eventually led me to WCC where I was met with the kind support and encouragement of my professors. In particular, I have astronomy professor Dan Majeus to thank for encouraging me to apply to NCOS. So what is NCOS? Next slide, please. On the surface, it's a program offered to community college students to broaden their knowledge of space, space travel, and the STEM field. But as you'll see, it's so much more than that. It's split up into two parts. We have the online course and the on-site experience. The five-week online course occurred over the summer, and it's kind of like the primer for the on-site experience. It was like a neat little NASA starter kit, and it covered everything from Earth science research on the ISS to black holes. It also culminated in a final project, which I'll share momentarily. The heart and soul of this program, though, was the on-site experience. The idea behind that is to complete an engineering challenge at a NASA center, but it was done virtually this year. And then the common thread that ties these uh, two parts of the program together is a focus on the Artemis mission, which is NASA's goal of landing the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. So next slide, please. On the right side of this slide, you can see the first page of the final project I did for the online course. I did it on something that I had never even heard of prior to starting NCOS. That is Lunar In-Situ Resource Utilization, or ISRU. It's a really fancy way to say getting stuff from moon dirt. The whole idea is that regolith, AKA moon dirt, is made up of useful materials such as metals and oxygen, which can be chemically separated and used for different purposes like life support and perhaps even repairs and construction in the future. The idea also extends to gathering volatiles like water, which is known to be especially abundant near the moon's south pole. I had a ton of fun learning about ISRU and getting creative, thinking about the different applications this technology has. Next slide, please. Now the next challenge was in the on-site on portion of the program. On day one, we were assigned a very daunting task. It was to design a fictitious moon, a, a di <laughs> sorry, fictitious mission, kind of a tongue twister, to either the moon or Mars from start to finish. And there was a catch. We had to do this in under two weeks and on a team of 12 people that we had all just met. I'm proud to say that our team definitely rose to the challenge and what we came up with is a lunar rover mission by the name of LOVER. Next slide, please. LOVER stands for Lunar Volatiles and Radiation Rover. 
I had the title of materials engineer for this project, which oddly enough meant that I was responsible for the rover's power system and power management to all of its science instruments. Nonetheless, Lover is designed to be a longer term mission spanning several years, and its ultimate goal is to gather data that contributes to determining the safe locations for future astronauts to inhabit. Next slide, please. So the three big science interests of Lover are listed and pictured below. Of course, these won't actually be put into practice because this was kind of a, a fictitious mission. And on the left, we have permanently shadowed regions, or PSRs. As the name suggests, they are places at the lunar south pole that have not seen the sun in billions of years in some cases. They are known to harbor significant amounts of water, so Lover would assess the distribution and concentration of water in and around these regions. The middle picture is of a lunar swirl, which is, is essentially a spot with a small magnetic field, and that helps protect it from solar radiation. Partially collapsed lava tubes, like the one on the right, are pockets in the ground that could potentially hold a habitat where regolith overhead helps with radiation shielding. Lover would take radiation measurements associated with lunar swirls and partially collapsed lava tubes to scope out their ability to protect humans. Next slide, please. In the meantime, while we were developing this mission, we were also having tons of fun. You can see a couple of collages we put together to report meeting attendance on the left. Every time we had a crew meeting, we would put together a fun collage of sorts and then send it in to show everybody who was there. And then my favorite uh, is the one on the top there where we're all like poorly edited into astronaut suits. I thought that was really fun. And I also included the James Webb Space Telescope on the far right picture. It looks like a honeycomb. And also an engineering model of the Viper Lunar Rover in the top center because we got to speak directly to NASA employees who work on these exciting projects and projects like these. Although I didn't get a picture, we also had a surprise visit from Chris Gardner himself. Uh, who was the inspiration for the movie Pursuit of Happiness. Um, it was really unexpected, but he's a very inspirational individual. And I never thought I would get to say that I met Chris Gardner at NASA. Uh, next, next slide, please. So when all was said and done, I not only walked away with this super cool certificate. Next slide, please. I also walked away with a few key lessons. First, I learned how important it is not to say no to yourself. I'm so happy I didn't discount myself from this opportunity before anybody else had the chance to do so. Second, this experience solidified for me the importance of grit and a collaborative spirit. As a team, we initially encountered many roadblocks with time management and effective online communication, but we continually worked to overcome them. And I also walked away with a bunch of new friends and memories for a lifetime. Next slide, please. I'd like to close out with a big thank you to the board for inviting me to speak today and for helping me to make my two years at WCC as wonderful as they were. Next slide, please. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Emily, how significant is the discovery of water on the moon? That is a big, big, big deal. I mean, wherever uh, we intend to bring life, in this case humans, there's got to be water. So the, the ability to have that um, right on site and not have to bring it up with us is a huge financial advantage. And it could also help in case of an emergency. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Emily. Do any other board members want to ask a question of Emily? That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, sounds, it looked really fun and um, it, that looked really great. Um, would you like to add anything, VP Hearn? You're good? Okay. All right, well, thank you. Um, our next report is the grants awarded to Washtenaw Community College. Um, AVP Snyder, are you ready? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, Here go ahead. Me. Well, thank you everybody for having me again this year um, to give the annual grant activity overview. I wanted to start by just reminding that uh, we have a very collaborative process at the college and the foundation. 
the administration, uh, deans, some faculty, uh, and the foundation work together to identify opportunities to submit grant funding proposals to both public and private sources to achieve our missions. And really this has developed over the last few years and is really um, ensuring that we're getting um, to the things that are gonna help meet our college's goals. Next, please. I wanted to start today by uh, announcing, and you've probably seen it in your, your uh, memo, that the college has been awarded a major grant uh, from the US Department of Education through their Strengthening Institutions program called Title III. We received just under $1.5 million, and we originally uh, applied for this grant back in mid-2019, and we were originally told we weren't going to receive it, but that we had scored very high, and they might fund additional proposals. Well, lo and behold, about a year later, they contacted us and indicated that we indeed were awarded this, uh, this new grant. Uh, it, it's been a while since we applied, but the grant is in, in essence going to fund and scale up our coaching program in other supportive initiatives for students, first uh, time in any college students that are coming to WCC and helping them to stay in school. Uh, we are going to be looking at uh, what changes have been made since we applied, but in, in essence, this is what the uh, proposal will fund. Uh, it's going to really strengthen the engagement of our students and the support our students receive in, through instruction, services, and support. The grant funding period, as you can see, will start uh, in next fall semester and run for five years. Next, please. As I mentioned, the target population, first time, full time degree seeking or uh, certificate seeking students. And we believe we'll be able to serve as many as 1,600 students over the five year grant period. The great, great part of this grant, in addition to getting the money, is there's no federal match. Unlike a great many federal grants, uh, we're not required to put in our own resources. Obviously, we will in terms of uh, staffing and, and, and all the things that we provide on an ongoing basis, but in terms of additional, this grant helps fund the additional things we want. The, the proposal is coordinated and edited by um, Amanda Peters and a great group of people, uh, including our vice presidents, some deans, and, and uh, people from the uh, college uh, support student services area. And we contracted a writer um, to help us write this monster. Next, please. So in addition to that good news, I wanted to let you know that we continue to receive funding through a great deal of public, quasi-public, private sources, as you can see listed on your screen here. Uh, the Washtenaw Coordinated Funders Group is a local to our county made up of St. Joseph, um, health system through uh, United Way and some other big organizations. But you can see the universities and the U.S. departments and the state departments. Next, please. So this, this report, this first slide, is reporting on new grants that were awarded and a total amount or an increase in grants that we've already been receiving. So if effectively new revenue in fiscal year 20, which ended uh, June 30th. You could see the CARES Act funding was very large and used, uh, it is being used for a variety of items to support the students and to make improvements at the school that are needed um, as a result of the pandemic. Very exciting um, and looks small, but it's a really large grant, is the renewal of our Youth and Transition Grant that is supporting our, uh, our REACH program that helps students from foster care. And uh, we were, there was only two in, awarded in the state and we were one of them uh, due to the really great program that we offer and the, the support that we provide our students. Then you can see some increases in our renewal awards that bu bulked up the grants that we received by that amount. Next, please. 
In addition, we have multi-year grants, and this slide shows the total amount awarded when it was originally given to us, and then the revenue, which is reported here for the fiscal year. And you can see the CCAC grant, which goes on and uh, will go for another year. Uh, you can see that amount, uh, Vice President Mueller and Al Lease running that program or helping to oversee that program. And of course, our STEM program, which will go on. We had significant revenue to help us with STEM focused students. Next, please. Uh, important, of course, is our continue uh, look to support uh, the Park Ridge Center for the programs that go on for youth activities. And as I mentioned, that coordinated funders is a good number of groups, large funders, who pool their, their resources and fund proposals that are, that are sent in. Uh, this begins, uh, as you notice, one part-time staff. We will tally at the end of this presentation the number of full-time, part-time, and contractual staff that are funded through various grants. Continuing uh, are the language program, uh, the East Asia language programs that are overseen by Dean Britton and faculty Redondo, uh, and that continues on. And I've been told that the courses continue to have new and uh, additional students signing up. Uh, this is uh, with the University of Michigan, and I think an important program as we continue to diversify and uh, offer different opportunities for our students. And then, of course, the um, Lewis Stokes Alliances program uh, under Vice President Hearns and uh, Faculty Dentel. Uh, you could see that we hire, uh, provide a faculty stipend and hire six part timers to help uh, recruit and provide opportunities for STEM students. So we had some renewal grants too, as you can see, a very important source uh, for us, uh, new grants. Uh, the adult basic education recognized across the state as one of the best uh, under uh, Executive Vice President Blakey and Bonnie Troon. Uh, it received substantial funding and has continued to expand uh, into Ypsilanti and expand uh, its uh, resources and opportunities for uh, students from this county. And we have one full-timer and 16 part-timers, -time -time as you can see. The Perkins, now in, under Dean Samolsky, and Liz Orbitz now has retired, and that, I think, will be transferred to another um, person in the student services area, uh, but hires two full-time staff and 18 part-time staff for occupational career-minded students. A program that ended uh, but was valid through the entire fiscal year last year was the Employment Services, the Job Seekers Program, which did have 10 full-time and one part-time running those offices, uh, ended at the end of our fiscal year and uh, has, I believe all the positions have been transferred uh, to the uh, state government and maybe to the counties. Um, Vice President Mueller, would there be anything you wanted to add um, on that the transfer of the uh, staff? No, it ended up, um, it turned out that um, they they decided as a Michigan Works Agency for the region to bring their own um, staff internally, um, but certainly we filled a viable role for them um, as they were looking to transition from, you know, the regular county Michigan Works to, you know, the, re or the I'm sorry, the, the city Michigan Works to the county, um, multiple counties actually. So I think it was a good opportunity for us to really um, cement our relationship with Michigan Works and be a good um, partner provider. Thank you. And the motorcycle safety, is, uh, which we received the revenue, but it did not, of course, have the opportunity to run this year, but we still have the revenue and it will, again, hire the part-time staff and the contracted uh, instructors once it's back up and running. And the uh, small uh, business development program continues to operate and uh, under Vice President Mueller and Charlie Penner and does have full-time and part-time staff. I mentioned the Youth in Transition program that uh, received um, a new grant that will start, had 20 fiscal year 20 revenue as you see there, still to run 
uh, from its previous grant. And as we wrap up, we'll see that we do, did have, um, through this fiscal year 2018, full-time staff hired 46 part-timers, including the faculty stipends, and then the contractors who were running and uh, teaching in the motorcycle training program. And it tallies up and shows that we uh, had um, a substantial increase this year um, with the CARES funding, but really still um, did uh, very, very well in, in getting grants, new grants, uh, grants uh, renewed and continuing to use the grants that we've been uh, given over a multi-year period. This does not include, by the way, the total, the 1.5 million for the new um, Title III Strengthening Programs Grant. Uh, we will put that in for fiscal 21 as it was received in that period. But that would be, uh, again, another 1.5 million. And I wanted to call your attention to work that continues on. These are all um, pandemic um, time uh, proposals we're sending in. We just submitted a major proposal to the Department of Labor for right around $2 million. This is a training grant for emerging uh, workforce mobility careers. And uh, I think we have a very good chance. It was a very strong proposal, worked on collaboratively around the college and number of departments. And uh, we will know within uh, four to five months on that proposal. And we have one that we, for the same program, we submitted as part of the Workforce Intelligent Network to be part of theirs. And if theirs comes through um, that collaborative grant, we will also receive some funding uh, to, to do our part of that. Park Ridge, we're looking again to continue to increase the funding where we can. And then the Student Emergency Funds, we have two proposals um, pending, which I think we'll get both of those for the continued uh, operation and support of the emergency fund, which has uh, really, really been in wide demand for the last seven to eight months. And I believe that's it. Are there questions or comments that I could um, could answer? I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Um, Phil, the uh, Park Ridge sixty thousand dollars. Who does that money come from? Uh, from the same same source, we're looking to see from. Uh, I'm sorry, coordinated funders. Okay, from we're Washington. The CFL. They've 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 been having some trouble, trustee Devardi, because um, their partners, of course, have had difficulty. The hospital system, especially, has had to reduce the support. Uh, but they have told us that we remain viable in the, and we were hopeful. I'm actually very familiar with that system. My wife. Um, when she was at the Washington Health Department, was uh, integral to helping with some of those funding decisions. Um, the other question I have, when I'm looking at all of this grant funding, and I guess this is a question for our uh, financial officer, where in revenues would I find this money show up? Uh, Trustee Devary, this is Bill Johnson. Um, uh, the, the money doesn't show up in the general fund. The money shows up in the restricted fund. Um, so you will see that um, as part of our, our audited financial statements where we show the activity across all our funds, including restricted. So um, when, yep. Yep. when I look at our bottom line budget at almost $110 million, this Eight something million dollars is in addition to that. Wouldn't the Washington, uh, the money coming from the feds to replace money, would that be coming into our budget somewhere? That actually, so like the CARES Act money, for instance, um, right. and the money that came through the state to help to, to offset their budget cuts, um, that will all come through the restricted fund. Um, so is that in addition to the 110 in our general fund? It is, yes. Thank you. Any other questions for AVP Snyder? I have a question. Go ahead, Ruth. Uh, uh, for the new wonderful Title III grant, um, uh, you talked about it helping 1,600 students. 
um, that seems like uh, um, the cost benefit seems to be out of whack. I mean, um, $1.4 million for 1,600 students in coaching. Do you mean that for a year each or, I mean, how do you divide that up? Is it mainly in salaries for people or what? I think I would turn that over to Vice, uh, Vice President Hearns if I could please, or EVP uh, Blakey to answer that. Yes, it's over a five year period. Yeah. And it's for a, a number of supportive services. It's, it's hiring uh, some staff mm -hmm. uh, over the, um, a coach, a data manager, a part-time data manager. So right away, we're gonna have some, some uh, reasonably significant costs over the five year period. Plus there's some capital money if we decide to use it that way to inc improve a space for the coaches. Uh, and then the uh, number of things that the st students will get um, is actually significant. Kim or Linda, is there anything else you wanted to add about that? It uh, feels correct. It, there, there's a lot of funding um, spread about uh, multiple things. So there's the capital expenditures and it's more than just coaching staff. Because the program is so focused on what those student completion results are for those 1600 students, um, there's there's a lot of uh, there's some administrative costs there. Um, there's some infrastructure that we're still looking at. We did do this pre COVID. So our thinking about what we wanted to do and how we want to implement this was very different than what it might be now. So there are some adjustments that need to be made, but the costs expand over five years. So it's basically building a complete administrative as well as coaching and wraparound services and support um, for students. And then there's gonna be kind of the building down of those expenses, pushing down of those expenses, um, because we should be able to scale up, you know, those best practices from there to impact more of our own, you know, more students um, yeah. in the program long term or just our students in general. Yeah. How many new students do we have this fall? So keep in mind that that this grant can only serve students who are first time, full time degree seeking. It basically uses the federal definition for um, who is calculated into the federal graduation rate. Mm -hmm. So that that's the limitation on this grant restricted that. So it's specifically looking at how to improve your federal graduation rate. And so if you think about the large number of students that we have coming in that have already attended another college, they're not eligible for that for that federal graduation rate. So it's only the first time full time degree seeking students who can be served under this grant. Um, I know that we're going to talk about that later, but how many students, for instance, this fall do we have that are first time full time degree seeking? It's about uh, five between 550 and 600. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I think the one point to make too, though, is that the grant would promote more students being able to be put into that bucket of full-time degree-seeking students as well. So, you know, one of the goals is to increase the number of full-time students we have who are at least progressing to their associate's degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from the board on the grants? Okay. It was a good report. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I just would like to thank um, AVP Snyder as well as the team that writes all these grants behind the scenes. It's a lot of work as well as the business office that supports um, you know, every grant in terms of the bookkeeping and things that we have to do. So um, thank you so very much. And we have a philosophy uh, that we only go after grants that we would have done without the money. So we never just go after a grant. If it's not something we would do, and it, then we're not going to go after it. And it's, we also go after grants that will help us either improve something we're already doing or something that will be able to like uh, a new initiative. It, sometimes they help us write curriculum. There's all sorts of things that these grants do. 
So um, there, we're very selective on the type of grants that we go after as an institution. So I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to the annual student and financial aid report for the fall. Uh, EVP Blakey, are you ready? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, it's that time of year, the October board meeting, where we have the um, student annual profile for 2019-20 and the fall profile. And then we also will have the financial aid profile for 2019-20. And Lori Trapp, the director of financial aid, will be joining me. Okay. So all data that we have um, for the enrollment profiles is reported to the state. Um, remember that the fall enrollment is based on the official federal count date, which is October 15th. And there's an infographic in your packet that has um, kind of an overview of some of the major statistics. Mm -hmm. So for 2019-20, uh, we had 21,037 students enrolled in credit classes. Um, that's the unduplicated headcount for fall 20, winter 20, and the summer 2020 semester. Um, that was 197 students less than the prior academic year, so we were down less than 1%. Um, I think this, you know, if you think that we, we were impacted that we halfway through the March winter semester, and then in summer we ran um, very, no ATP, advanced transportation and public service courses, very few. And we also had um, not, we didn't run a lot of our science classes. So with that loss of those classes, um, I think it's pretty astounding that we were only down less than 1% for the prior academic year. We had um, close to 8,200 new students. That was an increase of 150 or 2% over our prior academic year. So annually, our minority student enrollment was at 33.4%. Um, that compares to the minority composition of the county at 27.7%. And we, had, we did have an increase. Um, the prior academic year was 32.2% minority enrollment, and so we did um, increase. Our male students um, decreased by 92. Um, so 51% of our students were male for 2019-20 and 49% female. If we go back five years, um, we had slightly more males at 52%. If we look at the educational level of the students who, the new students who entered um, the college in 2019-20, we had um, a decrease in the, in the students who are coming as college graduates. We had 230 less students coming in as college graduates. Uh, we had an increase, we had 267 additional students who came in, a 9% increase who students coming in who had attended another college or university prior to attending Washtenaw. And 11% of our new students were current high school students. Keep in mind that, um, of, you know, and this goes back to, you know, when we're trying to do our uh, federal graduation rate, 56% of the new students who came in last year had prior college. So 15% were college grads but 56% had prior college, prior to coming to us. So annually, if you look at the age distribution of our students, uh, we had uh, students who were age 17 and below increased 17%. Um, um, we went to about almost 1,400 students at that age group. Students 18 to 20 also increased 2%. Uh, in the age categories of the 21 to 24, we decreased 6%. And the 25 to 34, we also decreased by 1%. If we look at our enrollments in our non-credit area, our non-credit enrollment was 8,744. And again, I think taking into account um, the impact of COVID, that was a decrease of 7% over the prior academic year. Um, the non-credit area offered courses in 45 subject areas, but the five areas listed um, on the screen accounted for 47% of the non-credit enrollments. 
if we look at the awards that we gave last academic year, our total awards were close to 3,500. Our certificates were at 2,087. Um, that was down 18% over the prior year. Our associate degrees were down 77. They were down 5%. If you remember the last academic year, we were up 15% in our associate degrees. Again, we've been focusing on um, degree completion. Remember that these awards had to be posted by August. Um, and we had students, um, you can see our loss of Sina. And Sina is our certified nursing assistant certificate. Um, the prior academic year, we had 406 students who received that certificate. This year, we were down at 185. So um, over ha nearly half of our loss in certificates was due to the our not having um, Sina, students being able to complete the Sina. And that was primarily due to lack of access to clinicals um, during COVID at the end of winter and also during um, summer semester. Because again, these are all programs that had to be completed by the um, end of August. So we also had some other uh, PTA and nursing where students, we had less students graduating again by the end of August. Uh, those students are now completing the program as they be able to get, as they get, are able to access their clinicals. Um, their degrees will just be posted um, later than um, by the end of August. We did continue to have a strength in our um, MTA, our Liberal Arts Transfer, Michigan Transfer Associate or a program certificate. Um, those were up. We had over 1,100 students get the MTA certificate. That was up from 1,061 the prior year. And we continue to see increases in our uh, trade partner, our UA, our United Association Awards. We had um, the construction supervision associate degree was up, as well as the construction supervision certificate as well. The infographic sheet that is was in your packet, um, the first two columns are, are the annual kind of update covering 1920, and the right column covers our fall 2020 facts. Now I'm going to hand it over to our Director of Financial Aid, Lori Trapp, who will cover the 2019-20 financial aid profile. Great. Thank you, Linda. So in the 2019-20 academic year, the Financial Aid Office gave $31,257,637 to students. That is a 2.5% decrease since the 18-19 year, and that is just over $800,000. The number of students receiving financial aid, we had 5,983 students who received some type of financial aid that compares to 6,121 students for the prior academic year. The percentage of WCC students who receive aid has stayed just about the same. We are at 28.4% of WCC students credit students who receive financial aid, and that's down just a bit from 28.8% from the prior year. And then below you can see in any particular semester um, how those percentages uh, range anywhere from 37.3 in the fall and then down to 28.1% in the summer semester. Of, that financial, of those financial aid dollars that come into the office, approximately 11 million is used to pay tuition and fees this past year. An additional $864,000 was used to purchase books and supplies at the WCC bookstore. This is a decrease of just over $100,000 from the 18-19 year, and that can be attributed to all of the good work with OERs by faculty uh, students have more choices when they're getting their books. They can rent books, digital books, so those prices can also vary. Financial aid comes from several sources. You can see there are a little pie of federal, state, WCC, and external. And just a note about external, that does include the WCC Foundation. So as I go through the, the presentation, keep that in mind, and we'll talk uh, about the good work the Foundation is doing in a little bit. The federal amount is just over 27 million, a little bit over a million from the state of Michigan. WCC is at 800,000, and then that 2.2 in the external bucket. There are four different types of financial aid. So there are grants, scholarships, loans, and work study. 
For grants, the biggest grant that we have is the federal Pell Grant, and we'll show what that dollar amount is here in just a second. But grants are just over 14 million, almost $3 million in scholarships. Our loan volume is at 13.6 million, and that is a decrease since the last year. So that's part of where our decrease in dollar amounts come from is from the decrease in the loan volume. Work study, we are at $242,300. The federal financial aid uh, is at $27,211,000, and that compares to almost $29 million last year. You can see that the federal Pell Grant is at $12.8 million. Student loans, I've totaled up the unsubsidized and the subsidized student loan to get to $13.6 million. We have a few parents who take advantage of the parent loan for undergraduate students. That's at $58,000. And then I combined the three grants together, our Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, Fostering Futures, and funds through the Perkins Grant that go to students, and that's at 433,000. And then again, there is our work study number. For federal work study, we had 67 students who were paid $242,000. They work on campus. They did, we'll talk about what ha has happened to our work studies. They have jobs in media services, club sports, the recycling center. They also do community service jobs at both the Harriet Street Center and Park Ridge Center. We have a part of our um, part of the thing we have to do with our work study funds is we do have to use some of those some of that funding for community service jobs. We had 11 students who worked in community service and earned just over $47,000. We also, of that community service money, we are required to have tutors, to pay tutors to help youth in math, reading, and writing. And that work does occur at the Park Ridge Center. And you can see other things that the work study students have done both at Park Ridge and Harriet Street, helping at the front desk, monitoring computer labs, and assisting the community in other ways. Our state of Michigan funding is just over a million dollars. It's stayed pretty steady since last year. And you can see that the tuition incentive grant um, remains very strong for us. We have $942,000, which is an 80.7% increase over the last five years in TIP. As a reminder to the board that um, WCC does provide funding uh, directly to students. We have our high school scholarship program, the Presidents and Procassini. Those scholarships offer six full tuition and book scholarships for each public high school in Washtenaw County. Those are renewed for a second year based on academic performance. We also offer 50 excellence scholarships that are worth $3,000 to a graduate from any high school, anywhere, or a homeschooled student. So in 2019-20, 488 students received just over $800,000 directly from WCC. We had 163 high school graduates that were given $485,000, and we also assisted them with an additional $84,000 for books. That number is a slight increase of $16,000 since the 18-19 academic year. The college also helps students in other ways. We, um, these are funds that are included in my scholarship budget but are not administered directly by the financial aid office. We give emeritus students a scholarship that total for last year was just over $400,000. Of that number, 161,000 went to students who were taking credit classes. And then you can see the property, work and district property and district amount of $204,000 the Livingston County Scholarship, and the Partner High School Scholarships. External sources. So we had $2.2 million, which is an increase in 60, of just over 65% since 2018-19 in this area. I have a slide, the next slide, spoiler alert, it's all about the WCC Foundation, but they gave $1.7 million to students. We also had a significant increase in our external scholarship dollars. Those are, that's funding that comes into the office via checks from local community um, sources that students may bring with them. We had an increase of 27% in dollar amount and 19.2% in the number of students since 1819. 
that should say not 1920, I'm sorry. But we also gave $156,600 to 23 STEM students and, and ABP Snyder talked about that funding. So that shows up there. So WCC Foundation, last year they gave 1.7 million to 1,543 students. That is an increase of over 60% since 1819 and a total increase of 163% over the last five years. And you can see how that bar graph went right on up. Those funds are for tuition, books, childcare, and other expenses, uh, educational expenses for students. The foundation also does a lot of good work as AVP Snyder mentioned around and with the emergency fund. Students apply confidentially on the WCC website for those emergency funds. There is a committee of staff from the foundation and student services area that helped determine the eligibility. In 1920, there were 165 students who received $40,804 through the fund. Since its inception, the foundation has helped more than 350 students with over $86,000 since the winter of 2017. And you can see they give a lot of Kroger cards and Meyer cards for gas and food. They help with utilities and specifically in the last several months, they've been helping with laptops and other technology. Another important service that happens with students who apply to the emergency fund is that they can be referred to other agencies or resources on campus, which may help with their specific situations. You also have a financial aid infographic sheet in the profile and similar to the student um, infographic sheet, the left columns cover the 1920 facts, then the right column will speak specifically to the fall 2020 facts. So that's what we have done and what are we doing now? You've probably heard about the Futures for Frontliners Scholarship. Um, it is a state scholarship program for Michiganders without college degrees who worked in essential industries during the state COVID-19 shutdown during the spring of 2020, specifically between April 1st and June 30th. The governor, Governor Whitmer, has defined what essential industry jobs are and were, and those includes include things like healthcare workers, grocery and convenience store workers, first responders, critical manufacturing jobs, bus drivers, lab workers, just to name a few. Eligible people have to have worked at least 20 hours per week for 11 of the, th for 11 of the 13 weeks, and the state determines that eligibility. The scholarship provides essential frontline workers with tuition free access to local community colleges to pursue an associate degree or a certificate. Students cannot, cannot already have one of those degrees, an associate or a bachelor's degree. If they do, they are not eligible. And it's important to note that the scholarship will pay the in-district tuition and fee amount regardless of the tuition that the student is being charged. Another thing you will hear is that Futures for Frontliners is a last dollar scholarship. What that means is it's going to pay after other tuition only funds pay to the student and after their Pell Grant would pay if they are Pell eligible. That means that not all applicants who are eligible based on the state's guidelines and notifications will receive the scholarship. We also have to determine that the student is eligible um, based on all of the federal requirements that, that we would do for any, any student. The deadline to apply for the scholarship on the state's website is December 30th of, 31st, excuse me, of 2020. So what do we know so far about futures for frontliners? We're learning, we are getting a lot of information from the state right now. As of yesterday, we had 3,040 applicants who listed WCC as the college they wanted to attend. Many of those students in our analysis already have a relationship with the college or our current students. 672 of the 3,000 are processed so far as eligible by the state. Um, as I mentioned, we have, to we have to determine final eligibility based on the student's FAFSA data and other aid that they receive. Applicants will continue to move to eligible as the state processes them um, and specifically around the type of work that they did and if they worked the appropriate number of hours and things like that. So our number of eligible students, I would anticipate that to grow. 
So how has financial aid been doing remote? We are fully operational. We have been fully operational. Within the first week of um, leaving campus, thanks to a lot of good work by the IT department, we were able to answer our phones. That was the biggest hurdle that we got off over very quickly. Um, we establish virtual meetings on a regular basis with students if needed, if they need help filling out their FAFSA or completing other paperwork. We are part of the Virtual Welcome Center via Zoom along with the student connection. And students, because of the software that we use, have always been able to upload their documents securely and remotely through MyWCC. So that, that jump wasn't as big for us. We were always able to do that. We also received some regulatory relief during the pandemic. So when students, work-study students had to quit working in March, there was regulation updates that allowed us to continue to pay those students through the end of the winter semester, even if their job did not continue. During that time frame, we had 41 students who were paid $50,390. Of our SEOG funding, our Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant funding, we um, <clears throat> were able to use some of that as emergency grants for students. And if students presented to the office or, or we got referrals from other areas with unusual circumstances and we couldn't help them in another way, we were able to give them this sort of emergency grant from our SEOG funding. We had 30 students who received $55,764. There was also regulatory relief around refunds that we would need, that needed to be calculated during that time period. And we did not have to return those funds to the Department of Education if they withdrew, if students withdrew under certain circumstances. The WCC CARES grant, so AVP uh, Snyder referred to this. Um, we gave CARES grants to students to assist with technology, internet access, child care, and course materials. Grant amounts were $500, 1000 or 1500 based on the number of credits that the student was enrolled in. Uh, to date, we have given just over $3.3 million to 3,244 students since April of 2020. You can see the amounts broken down there in the number of students by semester. We also took some of our CARES grant money to help students who had to take an incomplete for their winter 2020 class and had to return to campus to complete their course. We gave those students um, grants. We also used some of that funding to give 495 laptops to students. And then we are planning right now to award CARES grants money for the winter 2021 semester, but it will be for a reduced amount. With all of the um, CARES grant funding and eligibility, students had to be enrolled, they have to be making academic progress and otherwise be eligible for federal aid. It's a slow turn of the page for me. Okay, there. Uh, we, I had a financial aid team member who made personal phone calls to students. When students filled out their CARES grant application, they had to list a reason and they were allowed to write, um, you know, whatever reason it was that they needed the funding. So based on our going through those um, thousands of applications, we had 321 students who we referred to the Student Resource Center for additional follow-up. And then we also, reached out to 852 additional students, and we looked at their FAFSA eligibility, and we can recalculate their income on current income versus what they completed on their FAFSA to possibly do an income adjustment for them. I had asked my staff, because a lot of the work that we do, we, we talk to a lot of students, and I asked my staff to give me some input for this meeting and what would they like you to know. And so I have a few things from my staff. So this is from Michelle Potter, who made all of those calls to care students. She said, students were incredibly grateful that our office is available to work with them. So many of our students have been exhausted as their unemployment checks were delayed, denied, 
fraudulently taken, et cetera. But to receive a personalized phone call from financial aid with an offer to help made their day. From Amy Kenyon in my office, she indicated, she said that a student indicated, please, I am so hungry. That student was immediately referred to the foundation's emergency fund and food cards were sent to him that day. From Brittany Call Boyce, she indicated, I remember her sounding exasperated and unsure what she was going to do to survive financially for her and her mom. And finally, from Heather Waters, she said, you never know the impact you can have on someone's life. And you also never know the challenges someone is enduring. In these challenging times, to be that helping hand in a small way means so much to our team. And I think that really sums it up for financial aid. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank my staff, the work that they do to help students every day. And that's just a small sample of the things that they hear from students. And I know that some of them are listening in today. So from me to all of you, I haven't told you enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I would just like to add one thing. I'm sorry, is this the end of the report, Linda? No, no. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> I'll shut up and you keep going. <laughs> sorry. Pretty soon, pretty soon it'll be over. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'll transition to the fall 2020 semester profile. Uh, remember our official count date was October 15th. Um, we had 11,165 students um, um, enrolled. We are down 7.3%, about 880 students. And our credit hours were down about 3.8%. Uh, we were at 93,280. Um, so that Looking at that 3.8%, I think it's important to look at um, what happened at other Michigan community colleges. So this is a change in credit hours from fall 19 to fall 20 for some of our other community colleges in the state of Michigan. We see um, Oakland was at 2.5, but it ran the gamut to Mott being down 21% in credit hours from last fall to this fall. Um, you know, we never want to um, decline um, the staff have worked really, really hard um, for us to, to be only down at 3.8%. Um, and we are going to continue to work hard to get our students enrolled. But, you know, there are challenges during the pandemic, and you can see it impacted colleges across the state. Our new students were at 3,125. This was down on 328 students over fall 19. Our continuing students are a little over 7,000 and that number declined by 507%. Again, as we focus on completion and students completing and also updates to financial aid in terms of what courses that financial aid will only pay for courses that are in the student's specific program. We look at our full-time status and average credits. Um, our, you know, we've had over the last two years declining numbers of students who are enrolled full-time. We saw a jump this semester. So, our full-time students were at 28% um, compared to 25% the last fall semester. Our average credit load is also increasing. It's increasing for our degree-seeking students. It went up to 8.9 credits for the term, but the um, average credit load for our non-degree-seeking students increased it as well from 5.7 to 6.3 for the semester. We look at our age and minority composition. Our average age for this semester was 25.6. That compares to 25.9 for fall of 19. And our minority composition um, increased to 33.8%. Um, that compares to 32.5 for fall of 19. In fall 20, um, our dual enrolled high school student number remained level at 1,168. Our top five feeder high schools were um, the three main Ann Arbor high schools plus Dexter and Celine. Um, remember the feeder calculation is based on, um, it includes duly enrolled high schools and students graduating no matter what year they graduated from high school. We look at our dual enrollment partners. Um, WTMC leads the pack, but you can see De um, Ypsilanti, Dexter and Pinckney where we all have middle college agreements um, Pinckney is where we have our cybersecurity, our Livingston County um, Middle College, and Ypsilanti and Dexter continue to have strong enrollments as well. 
the WTMC proportion of our dual enrolled students increased from 40 to 42 percent from fall last year to fall this year. Some of the enrollment strategies that we've used for fall during this pandemic, um, the development of more online classes, our virtual labs, and our mixed mode labs. Um, that's noted in our astronomy and environmental science course enrollments that increased over 100% from fall 19 to fall 20. And we have um, our smart pairs are running Michigan transfer agreement courses in smart pairs that run first seven and a half weeks and second seven and a half weeks, which have been popular. And our business division ran three, four, and five week sequence courses in business and IT boot camps. If we look at our mixed mode lab um, courses on campus, this is where labs could not be delivered um, virtually. And so those situations are where the, the lectures in theory are provided online or virtually, and then the student comes to campus for the hands-on lab portion. Um, safety call protocols were established through extensive collaboration with the faculty, the facility staff, and engineering safety consulting firms. So currently we have 1,121 students who are taking the mixed mode lab sections on campus this fall semester. Um, I'd like to thank all the faculty and staff for supporting the enrollment initiatives during this pandemic. Uh, special thanks to Kathy Curry and her staff for the data compilation of the pro profile books and kudos to the marketing staff for their covers and the infographic sheets. Um, and remember that our winter 21 registration begins on November 11th. Are there any questions? Yes, this is uh, Davis, uh, Trustee Davis. I just have a quick question. Mark, can you turn the bottom on? Um, this may have been addressed before as far as the dual enrollment partners. It shows uh, Huron and the, and the other schools. and. Was there a reason why Pioneer was not a part of the, the dual enrollment? Uh, Pioneer does have dual enrollment. I just listed the top, the schools that have the highest number of dual enrolled students. Oh, okay, 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 great. All right, thank you, thank you. And also too, I wanted to mention to um, the financial aid department, man, you guys have um, really gone above and beyond um, to ensure that the students get all the resources that they need and, and especially through also the, the foundation. Thank you, yes, we work really closely. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, I, that's just, man, it just touched my heart to hear the, um, you know, what the students are going through, you know, having been there I, I understand the experience and I really thank you guys for doing all that you could do to make sure, you know, that, uh, that, that our students are being taken care of. And I just had a, 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 a question. One of the students had mentioned um, like uh, their check or something or another was fraudulently taken. Was that on behalf of maybe a family member or friend or maybe an identity theft? Why they had some issues with their with their funds? I think it was just a, a, a compilation of all of the things, right, that we all heard in the news going on with unemployment checks. So I don't have the specifics regarding that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that's fine. That's fine. But that just all of that uh, just really touched me. So I, I wanted to say, well, I like to say thank you. You guys are just really doing an awesome job. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Two questions. Go ahead. Um, my first question is for Linda. The um, statistics for our enrollment for this fall are there late starting classes. Um, that aren't included in that, that will bring those numbers up? Uh, if students are enrolling after October 15th, so the report includes any student that's enrolled um, as of October 15th. So we do have some, we had some second seven and a half week classes that started October 23rd. Um, if they are enrolled in those classes on the 15th of October, then they're counted in the report. So they're, they are counted in the report, you said? They are counted. If a student registered after October 15th for those late starting classes, they are not included. 
And do we know how many that might be and if it would have an, any sort of impact on the percentage we're down? Um, we're continuing to do registration. We had our uh, second seven and a half week class started October 23rd and we have some third, a few third five week classes that will start November 11th. Um, those students who, anybody that registers after October 15th would be included in the annual report for next year, even though they can't be included in the official fall data, they will be included in the, um, in the annual. And we've seen, uh, it's been, it's remained pretty steady. We're still at, right about at that 3.8%. Um, okay. And then for Lori, um, I'm really taken by this uh, availability of the frontline worker scholarship that the state has put forward. And it strikes me as a tremendous opportunity for grocery store and convenience store workers in particular, um, because many of them have uh, low wage jobs and not full time. I'm wondering, are we doing any promotion to try to bring in more of those people into the state program to hopefully to come to WCC or to another community college if that's more appropriate? We are, we are. Um, as I had indicated, uh, the vast majority, and when we looked, and it's been a few weeks since we ran the exact numbers, about 80% of the students who list WCC are already, already have a relationship with us. So that makes it um, easier for us to be able to reach out to them. We're, we're struggling with a few things. Um, we struggle with the data that we get from the state uh, for contact information for the students, but we are, 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 we're working on that and we've been going in manually and getting information. And then um, Kathy Curry and Mika's team are, have a, a whole communication plan set up that will address and um, everybody's in a different stage. They may be an applicant to the college. They may have been, have not been here for the last two years. They could be current students. We have a lot of current students who are also eligible for the scholarship. So the, the answer to your question is yes. Um, there is a huge communication plan that's being worked on and students have been communicated with. I did. Yeah. It just strikes me that the uh, grocery stores themselves, Kroger's, Bush's, Myers, their um, employee relation uh, departments could be tremendous partners for us, with us, for getting this information out, because it's uh, essentially something in, uh, something they're doing on behalf of their employees that will increase the loyalty of their employees potentially um, to offer these a connection to these programs. And I'm wondering if we've made any sort of a attempt <coughs> with the grocery stores. Um, Madam Chair, may I speak? Go ahead. To answer uh, Trustee Duvardi's question. Um, yes, we are. I love the idea about the grocery stores and I'm not sure I'm looking at uh, Yag Hearns. I don't know if we're doing anything there, but we are working with employers. As a matter of fact, with our degree credit program, we are working with uh, St. Joe's Hospital. And, you know, um, Dr. Hearns, you want to talk about it? The CEO and I talked about it initially, and then um, Dr. Hearns followed up with uh, Dean Greaves. And uh, you want to bring him up to date? Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, uh, um, Trustee Devardi, exactly what you're saying um, is a wonderful opportunity for us to pursue um, those direct business to business relationships. So we've been meeting weekly with St. Joe's just so we can make sure that um, the frontliners who do apply um, to the state get the assistance that they need from Washtenaw Community College. Um, and so uh, we've been working with enrollment services and we're going to host an actual uh, Zoom open house for them so that we can provide them with the assistance that they need to get them um, completely registered into the programs um, that align to St. Joe's Hospital. And so that um, type of strategy would make a lot of sense for other businesses um, for us to um, do some outreach. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely find a way to um, kind of follow up in some other veins with some other organizations. But we're doing that right now with St. Joe's Hospital and um, they're very excited. Um, they're doing internal communication 
on behalf of Washtenaw to get students um, to the website for the state and to Washtenaw to do their orientation and get all the information they need for enrollment. Um, but I think the grocery stores is a great idea as well. I just want to say the reason I, w when I saw the presentation, I'm sitting, well, of course, all the workers in hospitals know that they're frontline workers. A lot of employees at grocery stores don't oh, no. think of themselves as frontline workers. They are. They're vital to delivering food to the community. Um, but I don't think they're thought of in the same um, sort of way as the hospital and uh, medical service workers or EMT workers or et cetera. So that's why I thought the grocery stores, it's, you know, sometimes I don't think of them as frontline workers. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure many of them don't think of themselves as frontline workers, although they are. Yeah. Any uh, other question for Lori? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. On computers, Lori, the, the CARES Act uh, sounds like a great procurement. Uh, does Toyota also provide some computers for our students? I I don't know the answer to that. Oh. The, I may, Madam Chair. Past. Go ahead, Rose. Um, we're, what happened to Phil? <laughs> Is Phil <laughs> Snyder here? Uh, there you go. There's your Toyota you. answer. Phil, could you respond to um, Trustee Milliken's question about Toyota and the computers? Yes, I, I lost I lost connectivity, so I, I missed the question, Bill, I'm sorry. Phil, I, I was talking about uh, Lori's presentation with the CARES Act and 495 computers that we were uh, awarded, if you will, but I thought that uh, we also had an understanding with Toyota that we got some of their hardware when they acquired new equipment. What's the extent yeah. of that contribution? Yes, we did. We received 94 um, iPad and iPad Pros that have been received at the dock now. Um, they've been working through that and they've been delivered in the last couple of weeks to uh, our dock and we will continue to receive those. We've also inquired about receiving uh, laptops and the laptops have been going to Eastern Michigan and that was just because we had not asked for them. So we have a brand new um, representative on our foundation board who's a vice president at Toyota, as you know, Bill. Yes. And, um, he will be advocating for it. He actually advocated before he was even with us for the 94, and we will distribute those um, when I have a moment to talk with Vice, uh, vice President Hearns and how she would like those given out. Great, appreciate that. Now, back to Lori. Lori, so we're, we're the recipient of six or 700 computers. How do we select the students that receive them? That actually goes back to Linda. <laughs> yeah, so for, uh, for the CARES computers, um, we had we looked at students who uh, were degree seeking and they had to, um, they're ha at least enrolled half time and they just put in an application to us. And then they're also committing to be enrolled half time for the, for the winter semester. So, um, and then they were, uh, we shipped, we worked with Dell and the, the laptops were directly shipped to the students' homes. Um, and we also made arrangements if they weren't, a, were, didn't want the computer shipped to their home, but they, we did curbside pickup for them to pick up their laptop on campus. And what if, what if I'm a digitally challenged student? That is, I don't have connectivity or I live in a rural area and I, 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 I can't even buy connectivity. Do, do we help? students uh, in that regard? I'm gonna turn that over to uh, VP Hearns to talk about the hotspots from the library. Kim? Yes, Ian. All right, so we actually have um, even another way for students to get mm -hmm. laptops and or hotspots um, and our library has done a wonderful job of cataloging that technology and students can come and check that out and do curbside pickup um, for those items as well. Um, I, I must say with all the options we've had this semester, we've had very few students um, not have a need that we didn't have one way to address between the foundation, um, the CARES Act or the library checkout. So we're, we're doing, you know, 100% in regards to serving all those students needs. Thank you all. It sounds like we're, we're meeting a lot of student needs very nicely. I'm glad to hear that information. I think I saw Ruth's hand up for a question. Yeah, I had a few comments. Um, 
First of all, I was happy to see the increase in dual enrollment at Ypsilanti. Um, that's been growing, and um, I'm always glad to see that. Um, kudos to the foundation. I mean, they're doing a fantastic job of raising money and distributing money. Um, Linda and Lori um, help thousands of students, um, uh, which is more than you know um, a lot of our grants do. Um, they also keep us out of jail, so don't forget that. Um, when it comes time to the uh, financial review, they do a fantastic job. Uh, and finally, um, I experienced the virtual welcome center today because when I tried to log on to this meeting, it sent me to the virtual welcome center and I was very welcomed. So it's working very well, thank you. But kudos to foundation and financial aid is fantastic. I really um, um, give them a lot of credit. Take thank it. you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments on financial aid or this fall profile? Um, I'll just add, I'm sorry, who had a question? Is that you, Angela? Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say oh. something else, but go ahead. Okay. I, I just want to add one quick comment for the financial aid people. Um, I'm, I, I am taking a class this fall, and when I was logged into my WCC gateway, I just out of curiosity clicked on the link for the CARES Act um, scholarship or, or application. And then I also followed the link for the FAVSA. And even though I did not actually submit any forms and I was not expecting any contact, the financial aid office contacted me. They knew that I had clicked on those things. <laughs> and I was, I was surprised. I was really surprised. And I replied and I, and I explained that I was okay for now. I'm cool, but thank you. Um, and I just was really impressed. So thank you for, to the financial aid people. We're always watching. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know. I know that now. <laughs> um, and then was it, Vanessa, did you have something? I was going to say, I think I missed the vote for the agenda. So oh, if okay. we wouldn't mind doing that so we don't have to repeat this whole meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right. Let's go back and make sure we approve the agenda. Should we just call the roll again then? Uh, I need the first, the motion, and for the first and second, and then the rolling. Yes. Okay, so we'll I, do the whole I move, thing. I move we approve the agenda as posted. Okay, that I was, support uh, that. Okay, we have a first and a second from Dave and Bill, at least. Um, any discussion on our agenda that we're already doing? Um, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. <laughs> Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. I think she dropped off. Oh, I, I, see, I, know see her her say, I see her saying yes. I just don't hear okay. her. Yes. All right, I'm on mute. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we're moving on to the monthly reports. <laughs> um, first up is tab B, the personnel recommendations. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the monthly personnel recommendations as submitted. Do I hear a motion? So moved. A second? Patrick. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Any discussion on the recommendations? I have Good. one question. Yep, go ahead, Ruth. Um, are we planning to replace the uh, resource officer and the financial aid um, person? Yes. Okay. Um, AVP Mahaley, did you want to add anything here? Nope, it, it, it's oh, actually, okay. it was a quiet month for us. So um, just a, a few uh, part-time hires and, and um, a couple retirements, okay. but nothing else to add, thank you. Okay, all right, um, if there are no further questions, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. 
Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, next is tab C. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees receive the financial report for September 2020. Uh, do I hear a motion? If Artie moves, we receive the financial report. Do I hear a second? Hatcher, yeah. second. Thank you. Um, discussion. Um, EVP Johnson, would you like to add anything here? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Chair Fleming. Um, if we could go to the third page, please. Uh, page with all, all the numbers there. Thank you. Um, so the board uh, will note that we're down about one, 1. 1.6 million in revenue for the first quarter of fiscal 21. Uh, and when you include uh, the loss in the fitness center, meaning that we just didn't have any revenue uh, generated because we were closed the first quarter, it's clo closer to 2 million down. Um, the lion's share of that revenue decline uh, is in the tuition and, and fees area. Uh, and although we were uh, within our, our budget goals uh, for credit hours for the year, actually a little bit better, um, because most of our credit hours were distance learning versus on campus, the rate differential um, caused about 1.1 million down in uh, tuition revenues for fall. And in addition to, to that, we're down to about 700,000 in fees. And, and that's solely as a result of the fact that we, that we cannot run uh, the same number and um, capacity uh, of our lab courses, which have the higher contact hour fee. And so as a result, we, we are down in fees as well. So that's about one, about 1 1.8 million down in tuition and fees. Uh, the good news is, is that uh, our budget for this year as to state appropriations assumed uh, that we were actually going to incur uh, about a 1.5 million uh, budget cut. Uh, and, that, and that was following the same pattern as what happened uh, for the prior fiscal year. The good news is the state was able to find a way to provide a balanced budget um, for this current fiscal year. So you'll, so you'll see for the first quarter, we're up about close to $400,000. Uh, and we anticipate that that trend is gonna con con continue to grow. So that's certainly gonna help to offset the revenue decline. Um, we, if you look down below in revenues, you'll note the down in other in auxiliary services. So our contract training, uh, which is in other and auxiliary services, where our conference center in both of those areas, the the because of the impact of the pandemic, we have not been able to offer those services, and so there's lower revenue there. But more more than fully offsetting that lower revenue is the uh, the lower costs. So you will see that total expenditures is down about 2.9 million, uh, and uh, that's that's split about be, between personnel and uh, the non personnel expenditures. Uh, and then our our personnel expenditures are lower mainly for two reasons. One is that we have had um, a hiring freeze in in place, except for a few essential positions that we had to fill. Uh, and, that's, and that's really helped along with part-time expenditures. Because we're not back on campus, uh, the need for some, for some of our part-time help uh, just isn't as strong. And so those, those two items have really helped. Along with direct expenditures, uh, not being on campus has also uh, saved a lot of our variable costs of, of just operating a campus both facilities wise, as well as just within the classroom. So the combined total of that is about 2.9 million lower than budget on expenditures. So net net for, for the first quarter of fiscal 21, uh, we actually have uh, a, a surplus of about a million dollars. Now uh, items that are gonna face us in, in the future, of course, will, will be um, uh, the, the, winter, the winter semester. Uh, the winter semester, although we are going to try hard to run some additional, uh, you know, face-to-face -face courses if the pandemic can, conditions will, uh, will allow for it, we anticipate still that the, that, the, that the majority of our credit hours will be in distance learning mode. So once again, even if we hit our credit hour goals for winter, we probably will see a similar pattern 
of uh, revenue being below uh, below budget. So we are going to be watching this closely. But as it stands through the first quarter, um, we are we are in in good shape to at least have a balanced budget for the year. Okay, thank you. Do any members have a question? Dave first. <laughs> One question. Yeah. Um, I note on the expenditures uh, area, every line item, uh, the actual is under the budget, except for one. And that's general administration institutional services, where the my actual exceeds the budget by a pretty substantial amount. And I'm wondering why the variance in that category from all the other categories in terms of the momentum? Sure, Trustee Devardi, um, there, there really are two big pieces in that. There is um, kind of all the, G, the uh, G and A areas were actually running below, uh, below budget. But then we also, from a budget perspective, all of the assumed uh, vacancy savings, because we don't know where those are gonna occur throughout the college. So we hold that as one line item and it's actually uh, a negative there. And so you, you don't earn vacancy savings in that one line item, you earn them throughout, throughout the college. So uh, each and every month that, that line item will be negative and that'll be more than offset by the actual vacancy savings which happen in all the other departments. Thank you. Any other questions from members? I have a question. Go ahead, Ruth. Um, how's the fitness center doing as it reopens and um, are people canceling? Are they managing to survive? <laughs> that's, uh, Trustee Hatcher, that's a really good question. We opened September 21st uh, and um, as of last week, the highest sing single number of members that we've had at any time in the center has been 24. Um, so a, a very big, big day for us would be uh, a total member attendance would be around 180 members mm. for a given day. Mm -hmm. We've had about, um, uh, of our, uh, of our 7,700 members in total, we've had about 2,000 members as of last week that have either canceled uh, or have asked to go on a bridge program, meaning that they're not going to be charged a membership dues uh, but when they come off a bridge, uh, they, they would not be charged the reinitiation fee. Mm -hmm. um, so that we're, we're, um, we're watching that closely. We're starting to offer a little bit more surf, surf services, a few fitness classes, of course, done in a very uh, COVID safe way. Um, but um, members are still trying to figure out whether or not that they feel comfortable com coming back. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions for EVP Johnson? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVardi? DeVardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, next is tab D, the facilities development report. Uh, EVP Johnson, do you want to add anything here? Just a, a couple of co comments, uh, Chair Fleming. Uh, one is uh, the ML Pond uh, restoration, I'll call it dredging and restoration, um, is going, going well. Um, if you've been by the pond, you've seen that it looks about three or four times de uh, deeper than what you might, you, you might imagine. I actually, the, uh, the other week, went and kind of walked down to the bottom of the pond, and uh, it's rather amazing, um, just the amount of, of dirt that needs to be take, taken out. The amount of sand that we pulled out of there, I think, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, has been significant, uh, and we are going to be going out for bid to, to sell that sand, which is a very high quality. Uh, and so that, that, that project we hope to wrap up within the next month. Uh, and that's going to be um, significant improvement, not only to the performance of the pond, but also to the surrounding drain, uh, drainage areas. Uh, secondly, we have, you might know we have, we have really kicked off a number of important um, 
lighting projects. While, while the campus is largely quiet, we've taken this opportunity to uh, continue to pursue the energy conservation work around swaps, uh, swapping out the old light fixtures for new, much more ener uh, energy efficient light, light fixtures. And we're doing that in a, no a number of areas across campus uh, where, where budget resources um, can support it. The most recent one being the Children's Center, um, which have been, been, on our, been on our list for a long time um, to, to get done. And uh, we've bid out that project. And I might say that um, certain of our projects have come in at lower costs, uh, which is, uh, I guess, good for the college. It kind of reflects the times. Uh, and we're trying to take advantage of that to get some, some of our work done. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions from members on this? I have a question. Go ahead. The, the lighting that we're replacing, is that interior or exterior lighting? It's, uh, it's the, the interior lighting that we're doing, although we, we, are, um, we have on, on the drawing board a, ma a major project also for exterior lighting in our parking lots. I'd like to raise my hand in favor of, well, dark sky lighting that uh, is indirect lighting where the lighting is cast down instead of up and out. Is that a consideration? Um, Trustee Millican, um, I am really not, I'm really not familiar with that. So, so I, I, will, uh, I will have to get back to you on that. Aesthetically and, and from a light pollution point of view, I think those are worthy considerations and I hope you can put them on the table with the people that will be working on this. Great, thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Dave. Um, first of all, I want to uh, second uh, Trustee Milliken's dark side lighting request. I think that would be a great advantage to our lighting. Um, on item 25, the campus-wide roof fall protection study, is that um, going to include uh, a continuing look at the uh, parking structure and the safety concerns of keeping people safe from or decreasing the capability of anybody from uh, accidentally or intentionally falling from the parking structure? That that does not. Um, we 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 have been um, satisfied with the um, solution that at first we thought would be a temporary one, but it's it's really it's held up well, and we feel that it's effective at doing doing the job that we set out to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, What's the bird netting? I don't remember which where it is, but um, I remember um, there's something about bird netting at the student center. At the that's, student center, yeah. That's, uh, that's item nine on on the campus repair and maintenance. Uh, Trustee okay. Hatcher. Yep, that is. Um, so you know that we have those those amazing balloons that have been an alleged deterrent um, for bird nesting in yeah. up in the. The, uh, the coiffers of uh, the, the exterior overhangs. And they just, um, the birds have learned very well to, to, co to coexist with the balloons. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, and, in, and in certain areas of the SC building, especially around our, in, our entrances, um, that's caused um, a hazard and a, and a lot of extra work and maintenance um, for all the bird droppings that have fallen down on the in, uh, the entrance ways, uh, and so in those areas where where we have um, the in, uh, the entrance ways being impacted by the existence of the birds up in the coffers, we're going to be putting up bird uh, bird netting mm -hmm. um, as a way to deter birds from those areas. Okay, all right, and I also like to support the dark sky lighting. I think the um, the new retirement center that's on uh, Dixborough Road, just over the bridge, um, they've promised um, to have dark sky lighting. And since it's my neighborhood, I'd like to put my two cents in for that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. 
Um, next on the agenda are remarks of the board. Um, do any members have remarks? Hi, this is Trustee Davis. I just want to say um, it's great to be back and talking with everyone and beginning a new year. Um, we are in a contentious um, voting season, so I pray everyone ha um, will vote or has voted. And um, let's see you on the other side. Thank you. Would anybody else like to comment at this time? <clears throat> I have a quick show and tell that I will share. I have been enjoying my um, 3D printing class. And this week, my teacher, or maybe last week, my teacher showed us how to create a box with a fitting lid. Wow. So this is a hexagon shape that I was able to do in class. And last week, I learned how to create a threaded bolt. Ooh. It might be kind of hard to see, but this is a threaded bolt. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So those are a couple of things I, I learned in 3D printing. Um, it continues to just uh, be so much fun and amazing. Um, out of everything that's happening right now, the stresses of, you know, my daughter's grade school online and the stresses of husband going back and forth from work and being unemployed, um, my 3D printing class has been really pleasurable. And in the beginning, I thought... I should probably just drop because everything is just so hard and and I didn't know um, if I could do it all, but I'm glad that I stayed. I'm glad that I stayed in this class because I'm having fun and it's been the one thing that's just been so satisfying in these trying times. Yeah. And uh, don't forget to vote. <laughs> I guess I have a comment. Go ahead, Ruth. <laughs> um, I've heard from, from various faculty about um, the issue of cheating for online classes. I'm wondering if we're maybe um, VP Hearns could address. Are we are we making progress on that front, or um, just to, um, what's happening? I I I, I, I started to say that. I, I did not know we had a problem only because we are going to all kind of lengths um, to have proctoring take place. Um, if you all recall about a year ago, we brought Examity um, to the board because of the um, expense at that time in regards to um, that proctoring service. Mm -hmm. um, also been doing a lot of professional development on alternative ways to assess. Um, and so we've been working vigorously with Examity to make sure their service was up and running because they've had some hiccups with everything that's going on. But we do have a proctoring service that would alleviate any challenges with cheating um, that is going on in any courses. Um, and, and we see though the, the, the cost and, and, the, and, the, um, and what we're doing in regards to Examity every month. And so most faculty are using Examity um, and, and that's totally what we would recommend. Um, we've been doing some upgrades to Zoom. I know some faculty are using um, Zoom as a way to do proctoring of tests, um, but we've definitely been having a lot of conversations around, stra around strategies, around testing um, and proctoring tests in different ways. So we should not have cheating problems. And if we do, we need to make sure that we're dealing with them or making sure people have the support that they need for that. Great, and, and Circle In is working with it well with that as well? Circle, you know what, Circle In is working really well. I would say that we, we had a lot of technology being onboarded to make sure that we had different ways to help students. Um, and so I have some heavy using faculty who are using it heavily and promoting it with their students. And we're seeing um, a, a lot of really good interaction with students there. I'm hoping that we have more adoption of it um, next semester. It's getting off to a slower start than what we had hoped. Um, I know that both the faculty and students are dealing with a lot of new technology at one time. Um, sure. it, it, it seems to be working well for those that are using it. Good, thank you. Thank you. Any other board comments? Okay. Um, President Blanca, are you ready for comments? Yes, I am. Thank oh, you. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I really like to thank 
um, our HR department and Linda Blakey and uh, her area in re as well as Kim Hearns in uh, addressing employee needs during uh, this COVID. Uh, as you know, whenever there is an incident, and fortunately we've been okay pretty much in comparison to others, there is so much personal contact that has to be done with individuals. So I want to thank them because they spend their Saturdays, Sundays, nights, whatever it takes to get that job done. So thank you very much. I know, so I'm also very happy that the board has is um, taking a look today on the agenda uh, about renewing, extending rather the contract for our faculty, our full-time faculty, as well as our part-time adjunct faculty. Um, as I've mentioned several times before, I, I, I can't mention it enough how appreciative I am of the work that they have done, the collaboration that they have shown, and it's all of our faculty. I know it's not just the teaching faculty, instructional faculty. I mean, they are amazing. We also have non-teaching faculty. We have advisors and we have uh, counselors and classified faculty and all of them have worked together uh, in order to uh, address what's going on with the pandemic. Um, and take their delivery, the instructional delivery takes much more time. And really with this, uh, should the board approve this, um, it will give us more time to work on um, additional issues and opportunities that the college has at hand. So I'm, I'm very pleased that we are looking at that this evening. I want to just highlight some great things our Entrepreneurship Center has been doing. You've probably seen, seen them in the Detroit Free Press and in the news. Um, our director, Kristen, Kristen Gapsby, um, has been uh, very uh, successful. And uh, one of the things that the center has done is that they have uh, been a sponsor of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Internship Program, which is an initiative that's funded by the Ann Arbor Entrepreneurs Fund. And wait, this is like a tongue twister. The Ann Arbor's Entrepreneurs Fund of Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. Okay, okay. Um, involving eligible college students to apply for an opportunity to work and just listen to this at the region's leading tech companies and, um, and venture capital firms. And so this program is directed to assist students of color for, and students from underrepresented groups or students on Pell Grants. And so um, I'd like to thank Kristen, as well as thank the Ann Arbor Area Foundation for support. And, and there are lists, there's 10 companies that are part of this initiative. So that is wonderful. Also, um, Cindy Mills, Mills and Susan Dentel have been working with that same fund to define students who um, match opportunities in technology in regards to the STEM field. You know, a lot of times we, when we talk about STEM, I don't know what everyone sees. Sometimes, you know, we're, you know, we see medical or science and, but, you know, technology has a real uh, place there. So I'm very happy that uh, Cindy and Susan Dentel have been working together as well as the Career Transitions Office in regards to placing the students and finding opportunities for them. Uh, we recently won a $23,000 grant in a national co uh, pitch competition held by the National Association for Community College Entrepreneurship. And uh, I believe Dr. Hearns was a part of that. 
as well as Director Kristen Gabsby and Dean uh, Jimmy ba Baber. Uh, and what they did is they presented a pitch on HVAC uh, red, uh, it actually was a pitch supporting HVAC partnership pipeline to prepare our graduates for business ownership. And, you know, I don't know, I'm always calling one, it seems, but there's, that is usually those, those individuals do decide to go into business for themselves. So um, that was outstanding. So thank you so much. Um, and um, I, we have a faculty member that was won an award, uh, Mary Malillan. And first of all, I'd like to thank Mary for all the work that she is doing in uh, regards to faculty professional development. Uh, she has been amazing. And uh, Mary is an fa English faculty member, and she was recently named the Faculty of the Year by the Michigan chapter of the National Organization for Student Success. And this award recognizes faculty who promote student success in their work. And she was selected among nominated faculty from across the state for her exceptional work in supporting faculty professional development, inclusive teaching and learning, and support for individual for students and faculty during COVID-19. So um, shout out and thank you, Mary, congratulations. And we have a few student success stories to share. Well, we have a lot, but we're just gonna talk about these tonight. Trustees, you may have heard about the Ford F-150 Ultimate Tailgate Truck that WCC students helped create for the truck accessory company, Truck Hero. Students in our custom cars program uh, shaved door handles and applied the mirror perfect customized black paint to one of a kind truck with, which was put up for charity auction by the Barrett Jackson auction house last week. And are you ready? I'm proud to announce they brought in $275,000 in that auction. And the Washtenaw Voice, again, is a finalist in the College Media Association Student Journalism Competition. Uh, the paper's May 30th report on COVID-19 is one of the five finalists for best written special section of more than four pages. And it's titled Life in a Pandemic and how the three months of COVID-19 has uh, changed our lives. Uh, and lastly, we had 143 people attend our Career Catapult event last week. Career Catapult, you, um, as you know, we always have free college day. Well, Career Catapult replaced free college day this year. And the, it was a virtual event to provide career resources to the community. And it took place um, as I said, in, in lieu of our free college day. It was a three day event and it had multiple career focused sessions with different themes each day. Um, the sessions were held and provided from employees from across the college, including the career transitions, student services, advising, economic and community development and others. So thank you to Vice President Michelle Mueller and the collaborative team that put this event together. And as I shared with the board in an email, we did have our final visit for our HLC um, verification visit and it went well. And for that, I'd really like to, first of all, acknowledge everyone across the campus, the board, because you were part of it as well. and. Julie Morrison, Dr. Julie Morrison, for her um, work in, um, in lab, uh, coordinating the entire event. And lastly, I said that once before, I want to thank you to the board members um, for making time in your schedule to 
you know, um, help us attend these meetings, read the information, give us suggestions. Um, we, we really do appreciate that. So thank you so much. And stay healthy. We need you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on to old business. First is tab E, the recommendation for new programs 2020-21. Uh, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the new programs for winter 21 as submitted. Do I hear a motion? A motion to approve? Trustee Davis, uh, second. Okay. Was that a first or a second? Well, I heard Trustee Hatcher speak first, so I went second. Oh, okay. Um, are there, is there any discussion on tab E here? What any questions? I, I may have asked this question before, but I don't remember the answer, so I'll ask it again. Um, this doesn't involve any new faculty, does it? No, it does not. Okay. Not these programs, it does not. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for VP Hearns? Okay. Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeMarty. You're muted, Dave. Yeah, DeMarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. I think she may be muted. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next is tab F, the capital outlay plan. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the five-year capital outlay plan for fiscal years 22 to 26 as submitted. Do I hear a motion to approve? Do I hear a motion? Millican motions approval. Uh, do I hear a second? At your second. Okay. Any discussion on tab F? Any questions for VP Johnson on this? Okay. Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Tab G, recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve a contract to purchase the Argos reporting solution by Envisions um, for an amount not to exceed 255000 for the initial five year term. Do I hear a motion? Devardi moves that we approve this contract. Okay, is there a second? I heard Hatcher, thank you. Um, any discussion on tab G? Any questions um, on this? Okay, uh, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, moving to tab H, the recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the appointment of Brian Muthig to the Washtenaw Technical Middle College Board of Directors with a term ending in April of 24. Do I hear a motion? Landau motion. I hear a second. Okay, I heard Hatcher again. Any discussion on tab H? Anybody have questions? I just have one comment. Um, I was just sorry to um, hear that Peg Talbot is, is no longer involved uh, uh, structurally with the college. Um, she's done a lot of good work with us and in the community, and I wish her well. 
Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay. Uh, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Milligan, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVardi? DeVardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Next is tab I, the Student Center Renovation Project. Um, VP Johnson, would you like to add to this? Thank you, Chair Fleming. Um, the board might recall that uh, really the college has two major capital projects on its horizon. One is the ML renovation project, which um, will be coming to the board in the not too distant future. And the second one was the SC renovation project. And uh, we've looked at uh, a lot of different areas of scope of need for the SC project um, at its core. Um, it's a deferred maintenance project. Uh, the HVAC system needs to be totally replaced. Um, it's at that time. Uh, and we looked at other needs. We even uh, put in a capital outlay project request with, with the state for the Center for Success, which we think is an outstanding vision. But the state at this time, because of budgetary constraints, it's not accepting any new projects. So we, we can't wait for the state funding to potentially come through on that larger project. And we need to proceed with the engineering work around the deferred maintenance project. And so the college went out for a bid. We uh, received seven different proposals. Uh, we vetted those proposals and are recommending that we go with the firm Fishbeck, which is a firm that has done significant work in the higher education space in the health fields and specifically for this project, being that it's a, comp a complicated um, HVAC system replacement project, we feel that uh, Fishpec is uh, the firm that will uh, perform those, du those duties well for the college at a cost of 307000 Are there any questions for VP Johnson on this? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, more than parking lot replacement, HVAC is my second love on the, as a trustee. Um, do we, if this is a Michigan company, Fishbeck? Yes, yes, yes it is. And do we know anything about their um, history or propensities for minority hiring and um, minority uh, employment? I don't know. I mean, I mean, we certainly ask, you know, as a matter of process, we ask if they're a minority owned firm or woman owned firm um, and, and they and, and uh, they are not. We we have not asked them that that question, but, but would be glad to, to find find out more. We, they they've been around since 1956, although they're based in Grand Rapids, they have uh, 14 offices. Uh, throughout uh, Michigan and Ohio and Indiana, including Ann Arbor, they have an Ann Arbor office as well. Um, and they are they are particularly suited for this kind of work. Uh, they've done work uh, very much like this at uh, Michigan State, at Grand, Grand Rapids Community College, um, at Wayne at Wayne at Wayne State, uh, just just to name to name a few. I know of them in the market as having a good professional reputation. Thank you. I, I would like to say something. Um, I know that in the past that on their, um, on their bidding sheet, it would ask the question if they had minorities either on staff or um, in their company. So what I have learned is that a lot of times the, the um, company will hire laborers once they get to, um, to the site to work, local laborers. That's what I knew of. And that's, that had happened for a length of time. So I don't know what's been going on lately. 
with, with this firm, this is an engineering firm. So certainly when we, um, um, if we proceed with the project for construction, uh, we will be uh, making a recommendation to the board for a general contractor who will bring the, uh, in addition to, to all their services, their laborers. Uh, and, and certainly we have a series of, of questions around uh, the uh, strength and the attributes of those companies. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Bill. One more question, uh, EVP Johnson. I read in President Malanka's newsletter that we have a, an HVAC participation program for our students. Is it possible if uh, we approve this uh, contract that uh, any of our HVAC students could be involved on an internship basis in some of the engineering studies? Thank you. Something to consider. I, you probably don't have an answer for it either, but I wanted to put it on the table. That certainly sounds something to look at as an opportunity. Uh, I see Dave's hand. Um, Bill, I know um, looking at the deferred maintenance fund, now I know that this was probably something when we were looking at a the large project at the student center was going to be rolled into that. And now we're taking it out and treating it as deferred maintenance. Um, but the deferred maintenance fund, when I look at the balance, it's got an uncommitted fund balance of 1.3 million, but projects anticipated to begin in fiscal year 21 of 1.2 million. These are rough figures. So this would put us over the amount that's in the balance is this going to require a further transfer um, from our general budget to the deferred maintenance fund? Because I note in the financials that we've already transferred 1.5 million. And I, are we going to have to transfer another uh, 200,000 in order to uh, make this work if it's coming out of deferred maintenance? It's, uh, we also have funds, uh, which I didn't re uh, reference here in our campus repair and maintenance funds. Um, that, that we would also be able to use. And, and in all, all, all of those cases, they're temporary because the anticipation, and you're right, Trustee Devarty, that when we are ready to bring a construction project for the SC building uh, to the board, it, it will include the permanent funding for not only construction, but also to fund permanently this engineering services contract as well. So we, we right. this is just a temporary use of the funds until we get to that point. So we're, uh, this is just the engineering to get it ready to go um, when we do the larger project. That is correct. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, next is tab J, approval of additional 2021 faculty sabbatical. Um, VP Hearns, did you want to comment here? Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add that we have an additional uh, sabbatical. We had not used up all the uh, slots for the sabbaticals um, that we have contracted with the union. Um, and Dr. Kissel did mention um, that she submitted for a sabbatical and we present that to the board um, for approval. She's going to be working on um, some things with the Michigan Community College Association, um, and um, we're, we're I'm, I'm proud to support um, and bring that forward to the board um, today. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions or comments on this? Um, is there any reason why we can't vote on it so that she knows what's going on? I got no problem with that. Would anybody like to? I move that we move this to um, to a vote rather than discussion. Okay, so I have a move to move this to an action item. Do I have a second? Support from Devardi. Support. Any discussion on moving this to action? Okay, hearing none. Um, Vanessa, will you please call the roll for this? Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary Devardi. Devardi, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. 
Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight-Wharton? McKnight-Wharton, yes. Thank you. This is now an action item. Um, I need a move to vote on this. I move that we approve this uh, requested faculty sabbatical. Uh, second. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, um, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming? Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis? Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher? Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau? Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. That has been approved. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Next is tab K, um, the proposed tuition rate revision. The recommendation in recognition that the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic will impact the college's winter 21 on-campus course offerings and in further consideration of the potential financial impact that this may have on in-district students, the Board of Trustees approved the revision to the distance learning tuition rates for in-district. Uh, work in district and property in district from 108 per credit hour to 95 per credit hour for the winter 21 semester. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve this? I move this so, resolution to reduce the distance learning tuition for in county. Uh, I, I second. Okay. Any further discussion on the tuition revision? I okay. guess I have a question for Bill, and uh, can we afford it? Yes, uh, Trustee Hatcher, this was um, uh, through the board's actions for fall. We really believe this right. really helped our, our in-district students and improved the, old, the overall enrollment in fall for our in-district students. Uh, so I think, think it was a win-win. Okay. I mean, I know it's a good idea. I just wondered if we could afford it, but okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I want to speak to it. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Um, I'm strongly in favor of this, and I really want to thank the staff for putting it on the table, bringing it to us. Um, it's the thing we should do, and recognizing that students that want to be in person have to do it in as distance learning, and that uh, I'm very thankful that we've made a long-term commitment to improving our access to distance learning courses. And I think that it's reflected in uh, us being among the uh, best at retaining our credit hour enrollment or being as close to what we were last year. And I agree with our, our financial officer, vice president, that um, it's a win-win situation. This is gonna help the students out and by demonstrating our commitment to them, it's gonna uh, really, I think, build their commitment to taking classes at WCC and I think we'll strengthen our ability to maintain enrollment at current levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay, hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is tab L. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees ratifies the proposed one-year extension effective August 16, 22 through August 21, 23 between um, Washtenaw Community College Education Association part-time adjunct teaching faculty and the Washtenaw Community College Board of Trustees. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Hatcher. Do I hear a second? second. Okay, thank you. Um, any discussion or questions on this? I have a statement. Go ahead, Dave. I want to thank uh, the faculty and the administration for working collaboratively to uh, put forward these extensions. I think it really demonstrates our commitment as a college to our staff and faculty. 
And I, uh, I think that was shown um, when the, that the faculty union had such a strong vote in favor of this extension at this time when a lot of people are concerned about what the future is gonna hold. We're uh, standing up and saying, we're gonna stick by our uh, faculty and staff uh, and extend the contract. I was not going through some sort of a negotiation process to, um, to put a lot of things on the table. So I, I really want to thank everybody involved with uh, putting this, bringing this to us um, in this way. And I think it shows uh, good collaboration between the administration and the faculty. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, yes. Trustee Hatcher. Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next is tab M. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees ratifies the proposed one-year extension effective August 29, 21 through August 22, 22 between Washtenaw Community College Education Association and the Washtenaw Community College Board of Trustees. Do I hear a motion? I move that we approve. And a second? Support from Devarty. All right, thank you. Any uh, discussion or questions on tab M? Just as with tab L. Any further comments? Okay, thank What's you. What's the difference between this one and, and tab L? Oh, the tab L was the part-time adjunct faculty. This is now the full-time, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so it's just two different contracts oh okay, okay. yeah it's, one is for part-timers one is for full-timers oh okay okay yeah. okay yes sir um any other comments or questions on this okay uh hearing none please call the roll chair fleming fleming yes vice chair milliken milliken yes treasurer davis davis yes secretary devarty Vardy, yes trustee hatcher hatcher yes trustee landau Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight Morton. McKnight Morton, yes. Thank you. Uh, next adjournment. Uh, no, Madam Chair. Oh. May I just say go one ahead, go thing? Ahead. I, yeah. I, um, I was. Re I wanted to thank Dr. Julie Kissel and uh, the WCCEA board for uh, working with us, and uh, and also I'd like to thank Katie DeLong and Mary Barkoff on our end, um, and Chris Mahaley um, for the collaboration that everyone's shown. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, um, adjournment of the meeting. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved, Hatcher. Uh, do I hear a second? Yes, Support for Milliken. Thank you. Any discussion on adjournment? Hearing none, Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Fleming. Fleming, yes. Vice Chair Milliken. Milliken, yes. Treasurer Davis. Davis, yes. Secretary DeVarty. DeVarty, despite my enjoyment of spending time with all of you, I vote yes. <laughs> Trustee Hatcher. <laughs> Hatcher, yes. Trustee Landau. Landau, yes. Trustee McKnight-Morton. McKnight-Morton, yes. Thank you, everyone. Meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm.